It is refreshing to get to be together. Uh, I know not everyone gets to be. In fact, I heard a story. Uh, it's a quick one for those of you like, oh my goodness, starting stories early. Uh, I, I heard a, a recent story that uh, someone who was deployed was able to uh, join in online while their spouse was able to join in and they were able to, to worship together. It's probably, I think, a good way to say it. Uh, and so it's amazing when we gather to worship what's actually happening all over the world, and God meets us wherever we go, wherever we are, yeah? So uh, today is not any different, uh, yeah, today is not any different. Um, uh, I think God has intentions, and forgive me for saying it this way, but you'll understand, of, of messing with us in the best of senses. Uh, but if you've ever wondered if God sees you, uh, likely by the time we're done, you will be very aware that God has seen you. In fact, I think, I think this particular part of the Bible that we're going to open up is for every single human being that I have ever met, and it is for us every single week. So if you're like, for a season of your life, nah, for, for every day. So think for a second, if you would with me, about the problems in this world. Huh? Yeah, no, I know. It's, it's not fun at all. Now boil that down. Come closer to home and think about your problems. Think about particularly the stuff that you've gone through that have been the most painful. Oftentimes, it's relationship-oriented. Typically, it's where someone, and it's, there, there's someone involved. Not just you, someone else is involved. James is about to bring this up in a way that Super relevant, but it will go into your life. That's just a warning. So uh, we're in chapter 4 of James. If you're brand new, by the way, we've been going through a book called James. Uh, it's in the New Testament. It's, uh, it's written by James, who was the, the brother of Jesus, one of the brothers of Jesus, a half-brother of Jesus. And, uh, and he didn't believe in Jesus until Jesus came back to life, and that was the clincher for him, as it would be for you and I. We'd be like, all right, so now I believe you. No one else can do that. And that changed James' life, literally. It changed everything in James' life, where all of a sudden he sees his brother, who was dead and is now back to life. He's like, all right, now i got to remember everything he said, but now let's do life all about Jesus. So he brings this up. James chapter 4, verse 1, something you know, and, and just, like I said, walk this into right now. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Oh, some of you are like, we ain't got time for that. Like, Go to any news feed you can find. Every news article typically goes after who has a problem with whom. So that's why it's interesting that in the Bible, a long time ago, written probably 10 to 15 years after Jesus leaves this earth, talking about the same stuff. What what is going after? In fact, last week, if you missed last week's sermon, here's, here's where we end in James chapter 3. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other. Apparently, James continually brings up an issue that has not gone away. And some might even say, I think it might be worse. Right? Okay. I'll take from a lack of nodding heads. Yes, you agree. Uh, only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, emphasis on it's hard work to get along with each other. You don't just pick your best friends. We're supposed to get along with, with a lot of people, treating each other with dignity and honor. So with that said, the way the Bible was originally written, it wasn't written in tons of chapters and verses that, that you and I utilize to find places. So that then leads straight into James chapter 4, verse 1, that he finally goes after us. What is the problem among you guys? Oh. In, he's about to address it. So here is your tour guide warning. He is about to bring something up that not everyone will agree with. But that does not make it less true. Here we go. Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? What's fascinating is like, no. 
They're the problem. It's not me. It's fascinating that James leads with two questions going, hey, so what's causing all of the, uh, the, the fighting amongst you? And like a good dad, he leads with yet another question that's actually a statement. Could it be the evil desires, the, the stuff going on inside of you, that if you deal with that, maybe that could fix some of the stuff we're seeing in our world today? Maybe. Now, we've been doing word studies all throughout this whole book. And so let's do another one, that word desires. It needs to be brought up. Uh, here's the word desires next to the Greek word used, which means pleasure and lust. So James is saying, uh, could the problem around you, could the problem with, let's go, let's go real personal. Could the problem in your marriage be that one or both of you is, is having these, these pleasures and lusts over something, anything, and it's becoming apparent that it's driving in your, in your relationship or out of relationship? Could it be that in your workplace, uh, someone is, is craving something and, and chasing after that, and, and it's that, that, that pursuit of the evil desires. Notice there are good desires. That's why he's got to say evil desires. That means if, if he says there's evil desires, that means there are good desires. But the evil pleasures and lusts that we go after, he's trying to point out that if you want to know what's breaking down in the world, it's you and I going after stuff that we should not be going after. I know we like to blame the other person, but James doesn't go there right now. That word desires, if you remember class a long time ago, <laughs> some of us slept through it, uh, me. So let me just tell you what I didn't learn. Um, hedone, that word is where we get the word hedonism. Now, I'm, I'm confident that I had some teacher teach me what hedonism is. But James is bringing this up. And if, if you skipped that class, I'm here to serve. Uh, here's what hedonism uh, means. Uh, by definition, pleasure is the highest good an aim of life, meaning what should you be about? What should your purpose be? Uh, pleasure. Some might even say happiness or pleasure is the highest good and aim of life. Maximize pleasure, minimize pain. Some of us are like, what's the problem with that? Right? You see, when you, when you begin to maximize something and then you begin to try to minimize something, you better have locked on to the right things. Or you're going to find yourself, well, as what James is telling us, throwing away um, your relationship with your kids, throwing away your marriage, throwing away uh, work environments, throwing away um, friendships, throwing away so much stuff in your life because the community around you is breaking down oftentimes um, because we're trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. Here, let me, let me, let me, Here's how culture is teaching this. Culture is teaching, think of yourself. Huh? Some of you are like, I still think that's okay, David. And right, some, some thinking of yourself is good. Like, you should, you should brush your teeth if you still have some. Right? And is that not technically, is that not technically thinking of yourself? Like, some of you are like, well, no, bad breath. No, no, I'm done. But if you, if you want to keep your teeth, just the thought of like thinking of yourself is, is that you would brush your teeth. Now, this, that's, that's not the sermon there. That's not what you're supposed to get. But, but there are good facets of, of thinking of yourself. The problem is, is culture saying, like, think of yourself, focus on yourself, make life about yourself. Go after all of the pleasures that you want. Minimize the pain in your life, meaning cut off anything difficult. And if it feels good, go for it. The problem is, is if you chase that, James is saying, you will throw away every healthy relationship you could ever have, including one with God. Almost every adult I've ever met, including myself, has ruined a relationship because we've gone after maximizing our pleasures and minimizing our pain. It's a heavy one today, I know. But look what James says, basically everything I just told you. You want what you don't have. So you scheme and kill to get it. Now some of you are like, no, I do not murder anybody. Right? 
Well, don't forget how James writes. That's why we don't interpret the Bible where we find one verse and we twist it, manipulate it, like now it means this. You have to read it from the whole of Scripture. So if you just take the whole of James, notice James has already talked about how fire comes from our tongues. If you've ever actually had that happen, I'd like to meet you because that's incredible, right? So James uses language that's not always to be taken absolutely literally in this. So you can, you, when you, you, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and let me help and you kill the relationships around you. You hurt the people around you. I'll use the brash term here. You murder something that should never be murdered in your life because you went, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and you get it. And then you're left with wreckage. You're jealous of what others have. But you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. You ever, you ever had a coworker start a fight that didn't need to be started? No? Okay, cool. Uh, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, hold on, we, sorry, I am going to try not to preach forever, but I mean, just stuff. Sh- yet you don't, you, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You know why we don't ask God for it? Because oftentimes what we want, we know God doesn't want us to have. So you're like, I'm not talking to him about it. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only, oh, seems like James knew about hedonism. You want only what will give you pleasure. Apparently, today's problem is not a new problem. That every human wrestles with these evil pleasures, these pleasures that don't honor God, that God say, hey, keep that at bay, guard against that. And those begin to stir up in us. And if we don't pay attention, they rob us. Now, I know culture will tell you, think of yourself, make life all about you. I mean, like literally focus on you. But that creates problems. Like Tim Keller, he puts good words to this in his book, Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, which is the most politically incorrect title for a book that I've heard recently. Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. True gospel humility, which if if you're unfamiliar with the word gospel, the good news about Jesus. So you could say like like true Jesus-focused humility means... I stop connecting every experience, every conversation with myself. Oh, man. I think this is the current battle. Is the world says, connect it all to you. And what that's doing is that's building right now and molding a generation that thinks, listen, life is all about what I want. I should get what I want. And we begin to formulate an opinion about God. Oh, God must exist for my happiness so that I can get what I want. Meanwhile, Jesus taught over and over, deny yourself. Uh, Tim Keller he keeps writing in the book. It's not just one book sentence or, or one sentence book. The essence of gospel humility, again, the focus on Jesus is not thinking more of myself, which is what culture tells us to do, or thinking less of myself, which culture tells us to do that. I'll explain here in a second. It is thinking of myself less. You got that? Oh, let me read. The essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. Again, I'm just continually processing things that aren't my notes, wondering, should I say it? Um, sure, let's say it. Uh, <laughs> some would say this is the problem with us addressing racism these days. Where they would say the approach is, Let's elevate one group of people, but let's not just elevate this group. Let's throw that group below the line. You think less of yourself. You think more of yourself, and that's how we'll fix the problem. No. Because you're elevating and devaluing at the same time. That's not the healthy approach. That's why, specifically in the world of racism, uh, here's what's been going on. Think of yourself easily becomes I deserve this. Yeah. 
So you and I really have to be careful here. Because if you're unwilling to recognize that you and I both have desires that will come at us, temptations from the devil himself, and that just because we feel it and want it, that we, that we shouldn't just accept it, that maybe we should push it away. If you and I aren't willing to fight that, then, then the rest of this conversation is really of no value to any of us. But I'm telling you, if, if, if I could sit across from every one of you, I would tell you that I, I want every relationship in your life to thrive, most importantly, you and God. But if you and I don't wrestle this very topic, it makes it all unravel. Because it becomes, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve, which our relationship with God himself is built on what we don't deserve. So I would tell you, stop buying the lie that you and I deserve things. Let's just back up a little bit. Now, when I say back up, James is not about to back up, unfortunately, but in a good way. He's about to really <clears throat> go after it. That's your warning. Uh, here, so uh, kindly he says, <clears throat> you adulterers. We're going to deal with this in a second because translated in the English from the original language, that just lost some meaning that we're like, why is he all of a sudden talking to people about having affairs on their spouses? That's not what he's actually talking about. I will explain in a second, though. You adulterers, which is like, okay, what do you really mean, James? Uh, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? He's explaining the adulterer word there. I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Now, let me explain you adulterers, because you're like, that's why I don't read the Bible, because it's offensive. Uh, well, let's do a word study here. He actually used the word adulteresses. That's important. For those of you like, that sounds like semantics. It's not. When he wrote it original language, he actually put this female version of this. So now this might offend even some. See, it's always calling the ladies out on this. Like, what's the deal? No. What James is saying to a group of Christians, by the way, the church, he's calling them out, saying, church, <clears throat> you and Christ, you're having an affair on Christ. You're cheating on Jesus, is what he's saying. And he's calling the church out. Again, not light words. I'm not suggesting that, oh, that's softer, David. Oh, that's what he means. Uh, it's heavy. Notice he brings up the evil desires amongst us that, that, that create a war inside of us. And he's saying, you know what you're doing with that? You're cheating on your Savior. Now, how does one cheat on Jesus? Because those are fighting words. We move out on that kind of stuff, right? We sever stuff. We're like, how, how, how does... Cheating on Jesus, look, this is the best example because this is a quite literal example. Uh, sin, by definition, means missing the mark. I don't know what you, if you've ever been taught, like, if you just, get, let's get super literal, like Webster's Dictionary, but better. Uh, what does sin actually mean? It means missing the mark. And I think for those of you who, who hunt, I hope it's gone well so far. Uh, and I know, I think archery season, my, I have no idea, actually. Never mind, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> I, I was going to try, but no. Nah. Let, let me point something out regarding our culture, because I think this target is, is actually serving us extremely well with this. So if you were to ever get into archery, uh, at first, uh, maybe some of you are just amazingly talented, just hitting any part of this would be awesome. You'd be like, yeah, I didn't hurt anyone else. I didn't send it off into the woods or the grass. And, 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 and you begin to like, like okay. And then, then you begin to, in theory, get a little bit better and you begin to hit somewhere on here. But I'm just going to point out, this might be obvious to most, but let's make sure we're all very clear. The goal of this target is to hit the center of the target. Right. Let me help. <clears throat> 
when you're in archery, just going to make a statement now, the goal is uh, not a participation award. It's to hit the center. Whether you do it or not does not change the goal. Are we clear on this? See, we live in a society now that like, but I can't do it, so I've got to move it. I've got to move the standards, change the standards because I feel and think differently. No, according to God himself, who is an unchanging God, he says sin is missing the mark. In other words, anything outside of the center, which you're like, but that's really difficult. I agree. But to know how to live, we have to know the rules. And the way this works is, if because there's even one here. Look, like it, it hit the yellow. Come, I mean, come on, come on. It's close enough. It's still not the center circle. Sin is doing anything outside of what God says is the center of the circle, whether I like it, whether you like it. I grew up in a setting, and this was not my parents, this was just the tradition around us, in a very legalistic setting, which what that means is it was a lot of what I grew up around was based on what are you doing and what are you not doing. In other words, are you close to God and you measured if you were close to God based on the bad things that you could check off that you weren't doing? Anyone else? Okay, okay, that's, that's what I grew up in. And so, uh, Oftentimes when we talk about sin, most people don't like the conversation about sin because it all of a sudden begins to feel like this is all about how bad I am and, and how screwed up I am and, and how mean God might be and how difficult life can be. And that's why James interrupts this regularly scheduled program with a powerful, powerful sentence. Don't forget he's called us adulteresses. Huh? That's great. But then he says, and he gives grace generously. You know, uh, in last week's sermon, we talked about how we all make mistakes uh, pretty much regularly. We kind of stopped the sermon for a pause moment, and it was like, we just need to marinate in that a little bit. Let the smoke get into the brisket. Okay, never mind. We just, we just, need, to, we just need to be here for a second, and I think we're, we're in the similar setting right now. We just need to be here for a second, okay? It doesn't mean that we're going to stop talking about sin, but, but we've got to make sure that we have the sin conversation appropriately based on how God would guide the conversation. And God would bring up truth, but, but I love that, that not forgotten is that, is that there is grace, and not only is there grace, it is generous. Do you need me to have everyone raise their hands who thinks they need generous grace? Most of us would be like, can we, can we do both and this? Right? You should. You, you should be like, yes, I need grace and I need it very generously uh, applied. So knowing that there is grace, how do you and I, how do you and I not let sin overcome the things that we value, our relationship with God, our relationship with those we love the most, the jobs that we care about, the difference that we want to make, the purpose that we want to live out. How do we make sure that sin doesn't rob us of that? You should want this very badly. And James gives us a pathway. You ever been lost? If you lie, then that's great. You're in church. Just think about that for a second. But most of us, most of us have been lost before. Literally, like where you're like, I don't know where to go. Now, my kids find that's weird. You open your phone, and that's how you get your way out, right? If you've ever been lost before and didn't know the path to where you needed to go, you know how powerful it is when someone shows up and says, let's go. And that's exactly what James does here. It's beautiful. So let's, Scripture, as the Scriptures say, okay, this is how we get out, by the way. If you take notes, take notes. If you don't, start taking notes. Uh, God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is step one. So humble yourselves before God. Notice it doesn't say, you fix your life up. You create some sort of willpower 
It doesn't say escape your problems. It doesn't say get rid of your problems. It literally says, step one, humble yourselves before God. If you don't know what that means, that's why I'm here. Agree to the chain of command. Step one. Agree to the chain of command. Meaning, who is your God? This has been the long lie of the devil. I'll show it to you. Genesis chapter 3. It says this to Adam and Eve. Uh, you won't die. I don't know why I just put a southern accent on. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, man. Yeah. weird what goes on in my head <sighs> let me try to say this you won't die the serpent replied to the woman so he's calling God a liar God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat and you will be like God and the devil has been doing this since then He's been messing with in, in regarding our lives. Who's, who's in charge of you? Who's, who's really your authority? Would you like to be your authority? You should be your own authority. Uh, just so you know, I want to I prove to you that you and I have authority issues. Um, have you ever heard of an honesty box? Uh, it's, it's where uh, you're supposed to pay for something, but you... you you're challenged to be honest about it. Like they don't have a, like a cashier or, or a point of sale there. And so what you're supposed to do is typically there's like, a, hey, here's how much this costs on this sign. And in theory, uh, here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go up to the box and put the amount that it says to put in there, put it in the box, but no one's watching. So sometimes you're like, I'm mean, that suggestive. I mean, I don't know. Right. And so honesty boxes uh, work this way. And, and so a, a test was done. I love it when they test us socially. Uh, here's how this worked. As there was a, a college coffee shop and the honesty box was out front along with a menu there that said uh, how, how much everything cost. So all you did is you would go up to it, <clears throat> whatever drink you got, you, you ordered it, but then you went over and paid at the honesty box according to the sign. So one week they would do the sign, but they would put like pretty flowers all around it. Huh? Make it look all pretty. And then the next week, they would get rid of the flowers. And no joke, they, they would put eyeballs on the honesty box. And you know what's about to happen, right? People were three times more likely to put money in the honesty box when the eyeballs were on the box. Now, I know someone's like, well, I would have done what was right, David. Huh. I think it's a good example how you and I live our life based on who we acknowledge as authority. So I'll ask you the question, who's in charge of you? If you actually want to win the battle against the evil desires and lusts that are going on inside of you, this is what you have to answer. Who is in charge of you? It's fascinating that the world will tell you right now, freedom is in autonomy. That's what the world will tell you. Freedom is in the absence of authority. Freedom is found when you are in charge of you. However, what Jesus taught was freedom is found in in dealing with our sin problem. So Jesus actually taught freedom is found in authority. The opposite. Soren Kierkegaard says this, if you uh, like this nerdy stuff, it's, it is the normal state of the human heart to try to build its identity around something. I would even add someone besides God. So here's one tactic uh, I do every day, especially actually right before I preach. God, you have authority over um, just to walk you into my life really quickly, uh, uh, 
I, I love to be in control. It's, it's, I, I literally bite that apple all the time where if I have a problem, I just, I just assume the steering wheel and I love to be in control. Some of you don't love that. That is something I fight. And so I regularly have to tell God, and when I say regular, this is an everyday thing. I actually start my day off like this, where I say, God, you have authority over my feet. Take me where I need to go and keep me away from where I should never be. God, you have authority over my hands. Use them for your glory and keep them from any place, anything that they should never be a part of. God, you have authority over my heart. Help me love people the way that you do and give me a compassion for those just the way that you do. God, you have authority over my tongue. Help me speak life and not death. God, you have authority over my eyes. Help me to look at and see what should be seen and block out any distractions from the devil. God, you have authority over my ears. Help me hear what I should. And help me not hear the things that will destroy me. God, you have authority over my mind. Help me have the wisdom and discernment that I need to do all that you want done. God, you are my authority today. Lead me. I submit to you. And that is literally a daily routine of mine. Call it a ritual. If I happen to preach that day, that even gets reset right before I preach. I wonder what would a group of Christians who decided every day to say, you know what, life is not about me. Life is not about my feelings. Life is not about what I'm in the mood for. Life is about God. He is my authority. Today I submit to him. Could we begin to get victory? Could we begin to have unity in our community? Then James amps it up and says, resist the devil. Not only God first, the devil last, like just Whatever last is, James 4, 7, he just spells it out. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. If you're like, what should I do with temptation? Resist it. But the kicker is, if you resist the devil, he doesn't just stay there hanging out with you. He'll go away from you. I have a good South Dakota kind of story. Huh? This is actually southern Montana, but it still counts. <laughs> southern Montana, a rancher who had sheep was having a problem. Uh, the coyotes, or the coyotes, based on wherever you come from, uh, were getting the sheep, uh, literally losing up to 50 sheep a year. Now, what you can do is you get a gun, you stay out all night, but that tactic doesn't really work long term. It's not the most sustainable approach to do it. So she had a bit of a quandary on what in the world to do, how to, how, to, how to get these coyotes out and found that if you begin to resist coyotes, the coyotes, coyotes don't like resistance. They just don't like it. Like, it's like, what are you doing? Why are you coming back at me? So how do you resist coyotes? Llamas. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> this is what she learned. Then apparently llamas are like, coyote, what's up, man? What are you doing here? <laughs> it's apparently, they have no problem confronting a coyote. They have no problem apparently confronting a lot of things. I don't know what's really going on up there. It doesn't matter. They have no problem confronting the coyotes. And the cool thing is the coyote problem went away. A very simple thing, not like pick up arms and let's do this. It was just, no, just create a resistance. Some of us right now are so overwhelmed by the sin in our lives and the desires. And part of the reason is, is we've chosen not to resist it. We've given up. So perhaps you can let James speak into your life and say, hey, how about re-upping the resistance? Just resist the devil and see what begins to happen. And then close the gap. God is your authority. The devil should not be. But close the gap. Here's what he says. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. It seems very simple, doesn't it? In fact, let me just illustrate something by your life. Yes, you. You've actually been doing this right now. Already at this moment, you have taken the first three things that James says to do about getting getting victory over the evil desires of our hearts, of what's going on internally, the war. You have already done all three good things job. You have gone after that God would be the authority. That's the, that's the basic presence of being at a worship service about God. You're saying, you know what, you know, I, I want God to be my authority, and, and in doing so, that I want to resist the devil. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw close to God. This is not like rocket science stuff. This, 
Those three things, if you do that regularly, that's why most of us don't get ourselves in trouble. The more that we're with God, worshiping God, spending time with God and resisting evil, we don't find ourselves going, and I was close to God having this great time and I threw my life away. I don't know how that happened. No, it's typically when you are distant from God, no longer resisting the devil, and then you're like, and I made this decision. You've done all three, but there is another one that James brings up. Repent. Because if you're anything like me, you haven't always done all three. And you found yourself making choices that were about what you wanted, not what God wanted. And he says this, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. This is repentance language. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Anytime you and I go against what God says is best, it's because we've, we've put our loyalty somewhere else. And if you want to know what repentance looks like, this isn't like fake it, sit in the principal's office and say you're sorry because you don't want to get in trouble. Speaking from personal experience. James 4, 9. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. If you read that incorrectly, you might think, so Christians are supposed to be sad all the time? No, it means our repentance ought to be real. Not just to get God to like us, because that's not the agenda of repentance. It's to turn from the evil desires that war and destroy This is why I said at the beginning that this message is for every one of us every week for the rest of our lives. And James is not trying to be a downer. He's actually trying to give us the right freedom, freedom from sin. So what do we do? Uh, Let's leave the book of James and go to 1 John 1, 8, 9, a verse that all my kids have to memorize. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Meaning that if you go to God about this, he will listen to you and he will forgive you and he has a generous amount of grace to offer you, but it must be a part of the process where you acknowledge chain of command, God is first, the devil is not, and being close to God is the best. So whatever evil desires have won in your life, you tell God and you speak. You don't don't even have to confess this to me. Don't buy that. Go after what God says to do. You go to him and you say, I'm sorry. I don't want to have this in my life anymore. I repent of this genuinely. God, will you give me victory over it? So let's do that right now. Huh? So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I would imagine a church like ours, locations all over people, all over the world, that the majority of us have something that we ought to repent to God about. And so we're going to do this. We're just you and God to have that conversation. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment and you speak to him about whatever you want to speak to him about. And then I'll, I'll close this prayer time. God, I know I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interrupting probably multiple people talking to you right now. And, um, but God, I right now just ask that you would intervene in each and every one of our lives and that you would give us, would you give us the truth about what's really going on in our souls? God, I would imagine many of us uh, are, are lying about the realities in our lives. And so, Lord, would you help us to be honest about it and humble about it? Lord, on behalf of of our whole church, um, Lord, we ask for your grace for any and all of 
uh, the ways that we've gone after things that are sinful and just flat out against you, God, we are sorry and ask that you would forgive us and that you would cleanse us and that you would get all the shame and regret out of our souls and help us restart today. God, help us to be a church where grace is generous and the truth is true. Thanks for meeting with us, Lord. I pray for all the relationships that I think will be restored out of fighting this. I pray for, Lord, all the families, all the workplaces, the schools, the friendships, all that, Lord. Lord, would you do a miraculous work in all of them as you pry out the sin that has entangled so many of us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.